The supposed no. Well, that is granted. That is passed. Delegate from Petersburg, Delegate Aird. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise for a point of personal privilege. Delegate S. Four. Mr. Speaker and ladies and gentlemen of the body, I can honestly say that I stand to you in this moment not really having expected to speak today. But everything in my heart and everything in my mind tells me that I cannot be silent in this moment. Mr. Speaker, when I took my oath of office with my right hand raised to the Constitution, I did so firmly knowing that in all instances, I would stand for the principles and the beliefs that are represented by that document in all instances, especially in the moments that matter the most, like now. Mr. Speaker, I know that every individual of this body believes firmly that the events that have occurred over the past few weeks are unprecedented and created issues we never thought we would have to be discussing or deliberating. But there, but here we are. And that is why in this moment, I caution the impact and the precedent set by the action that is being currently discussed to occur moving forward. Justice is a journey, one that takes twists and turns and unfortunately is not consistently applied. As you consider the requests that have been made of this body, I ask that you equally hear the voice of a woman, your colleague, before deciding to really move forward with what we're talking about. Mr. Speaker, what does justice look like? What does justice look like for someone who has been accused of sexual assault? What does justice look like for someone who has come forward with allegations of sexual assault? And whether or not this body can truly deliver the justice that is sought? If I may, I would assert that the answer is no. What I know is that in the history of this body, when other members, statewide leaders, have actually been charged with criminal activity, no one has called for due process to get the bottom of those events, or for the possible unilateral formation of a special committee or hearings. What I know is that the seriousness of the allegations that have been made public in this case should not be turned into a political game. Because the individuals who are brave enough to come forward deserve better. There are women in this very body who have experienced sexual assault. And they know better than anyone the pain, the hurt, and can still recall what they've endured. And they know what justice looks like and the justice that should be deserved. Mr. Speaker, as it pertains to justice, what happens after these hearings? We can offer no conviction. We can offer no real action. And we would have taken all parties involved through a political exercise that in the end could actually cause more harm than good and could have a chilling effect for others who are truly seeking justice. Let me make it crystal clear. As called for in earlier statements, due process is absolutely needed and should be afforded to all. The justice and the due process that we seek should be by a law enforcement entity, not by individuals who will be on the ballot in November. Let me add further that should due process take place and our lieutenant governor is convicted, you won't need to hold hearings, form a committee, or call for impeachment because the women, the black women, on this side of the aisle will be the first people to draft articles of impeachment.
Mr. Speaker, as you have said so many times before, this legislature is the oldest lawmaking body in the new world. For centuries, we have modeled governing, and we have a responsibility to make sure that our actions set the right precedent. And this is not the precedent we should be setting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.